Is Iago simply pure evil, or an ordinary man embittered by circumstances and bad luck, who, by a series of extraordinary coincidences and chance occurrences, as well as linguistic brilliance, ended up being the root cause for so much misery and tragedy? Let's explore his character in detail, referencing in particular his use of language and rhetorical devices. Stay tuned, this is Schofield on Shakespeare. We first see Iago at the very beginning of the play, in the streets of Venice at night, arguing with Rodrigo, and this setting foreshadows his character. He, the supposedly superior Caucasian, will rapidly emerge as a shadowy, untrustworthy, devious character, whereas ironically his black counterpart Othello will, initially at least, represent the light of pure love and human decency. Another irony is seen in Iago's expletive-filled vows to Rodrigo. Abhor me, if ever I did dream of Othello marrying Desdemona. Despise me, if I do not hate the more he urges. The imperatives of abhor and despise are intended to show the strength of his hatred. He commands his gullible listener to hate him, if there is any evidence of him not hating Othello. But unwittingly signpost to both Rodrigo and the audience how they should react to this fascinating ranter. What is clear in Act 1, Scene 1, is that Iago feels aggrieved. Why? Othello has promoted a non-Venetian outsider, Michael Cassio, ahead of him to the post of lieutenant. Iago's bitterness targets his rival's lack of experience in battle and garrulousness, and he will make extremely effective use of the latter later in the play. He rages... Forsooth a great arithmetician, one Michael Cassio, a Florentine, a fellow almost damned in a fair wife, that never set a squadron in the field, nor the division of a battle nose more than a spinster. Sarcasm drips from the adjective great, showing his contempt for someone who knows all about the theory of war rather than the bloody, brutal reality. But these words also give an insight into his attitude towards women. He mentions that Cassio is almost damned in a fair wife, which is intriguing as this wife is never mentioned again. The consensus among scholars is that Shakespeare originally conceived the idea of Cassio being married, but changed his mind. However, a looser interpretation could be that Iago is bitterly, jealously pointing to how attractive Cassio appears to the opposite sex, meaning that he is bound to end up with a blindingly beautiful wife. But for Iago, this prospect means that the man is almost damned. The possession of a beautiful wife is therefore something which is only going to lead to hell after the initial disbelieving coitus. Can a beautiful woman ever be trusted to be faithful, resulting in agonised doubts and the man's mind full of scorpions? But Iago's words not only imply a distrusting attitude towards women, but a dismissive one as well. To illustrate Cassio's lack of experience of real battle situations, Iago compares him to an unmarried, society-pitied, helpless, passive woman, a spinster. These two utterly superfluous references to women give an insight into the working of, of Iago's mind. He doesn't understand women, feels threatened by them, thus paving the way for him to use them ruthlessly in his ultimate quest on getting revenge on his black master. Iago isn't just implicitly dismissive towards women, but also those men who waste their time serving masters without the prospect of worthwhile reward. He mutters revealingly, 
You shall mark many a duteous and knee-crooking knave that, doting on his own obsequious bondage, wears out his time much like his master's ass for naught but provender and when he's old cashiered. Whip me such honest knaves. The modern audience, living in a society in which seeking self-advancement is encouraged, is likely to have more sympathy for this perspective than, perhaps, the more rigid, hierarchical, Jacobean audience present during the first performances. Why should servants give exemplary, gushing service just in return for provender, mere food and drink, and be cashiered, or dismissed from service when deemed past it? So we might sympathise with this perspective, but the violence of Iago's language nonetheless remains striking. The passive, downtrodden servant is labelled a knave, a rascal, a scoundrel, who is compared dismissively to a stupid donkey, an ass. What should happen figuratively to these stupid servants? Iago tells us explicitly, whip me such honest knaves. This imperative introduce five word sentence is lucid and incredibly clear. From his perspective, honest fools that serve without any half decent gain or, or goal might as well be whipped for their stupidity. This is the language of a man who has clearly defined potentially lethal views about the futility of subservient morality. This is the language of a man who could potentially be extremely dangerous to have within your employment or trust as a so-called friend. As he reveals more about his warped, self-serving morality, Iago shows that he favours dissemblance as a tactics which can increase the chances of thriving and doing oneself homage. He confides darkly to Rodrigo, for when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart in compliment extern, tis not long after, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for doors to peck at. In other words, the day his outward acts reflect the inner feelings of his heart is the day that he metaphorically leaves himself open to be picked at and slowly devoured by small, grey-headed crows. The obviously disgusting, undesirable nature of this image, surely as humans we would do virtually anything to avoid such a grisly scenario, highlights the ruthless determination Iago implicitly possesses to hide his true nature. Thus, when he goes on to say, I am not what I am, this is a far more devious line than that uttered by Viola in Shakespeare's earlier play and comedy, Twelfth Nights. In the comedy, this is a warning line uttered by a woman disguised as a man, Viola, towards another woman who has fallen in love with her male persona. She is benignly trying to alert Olivia to the untrustworthiness of her appearance and apparent being. By contrast, here in Othello, Iago is aggressively showing his contempt for those that limply and simply align the inward with the outward, and his own determination to confound expectations about his own character. So Iago shocks with the violence of his language, is aggrieved at being passed over for promotion by a pen pusher, feels threatened by women, and despises the notion of service without tangible benefits. Additionally, in the first scene, he shows his adeptness at inciting others to act. Rodrigo is a mere Venetian gentleman in love with Desdemona, and comes across almost as, as stupid as Sir Andrew Aguecheek in Twelfth Night. Thus the tactics Iago uses to rouse him into acting do not need to be as subtle and devious as those he will later employ with Othello, who enjoys the higher rank of an army general. Following his long diatribe about the logic of masking malign feelings behind the convenient cloak of polite honesty, Iago bombards Rodrigo with an intense list of imperative commands. He instructs the latter to furiously wake up Desdemona's father to alert him to the fact his daughter has secretly ran off and married Othello. Rouse him, he starts. Make after him, poison his delight, proclaim him in the street, incense her kinsman, and though he in a fertile climate dwell, plague him with flies. These are fast-paced commands intended to overwhelm Rodrigo and incite him into feverish action. 
Shakespeare uses the rhetorical device of a syndeton, whereby conjunctions are admitted. It is not rouse him, then, afterwards make after him, following this, poison his delights. No, it is the far more condensed and intensive rouse him, make after him, poison his delight. And the effect of this is that Rodrigo is not given any space to breathe or act. He has effectively become Iago's first pawn, the first of many to come within the play. But what is also interesting here is the malign desire Iago demonstrates for others to suffer. Unlike with Othello, there is no evidence to suggest that Brabantio has caused Iago any particular harm or distress. Yet he declares that Rodrigo should plague him with flies. This verb has connotations of widespread biblical suffering imposed by a furious, vengeful Old Testament god. Iago is hell-bent on Brabantio, experiencing extreme anguish, whilst the reference to a plague of flies conjures up image of incessant buzzing, the inability to clearly see due to the non-stop landing of dirty insects and the destruction of any mental serenity. The overall implication is that Iago may have become so twisted by his own lack of promotion or inherent evil, it is not possible to determine which at this point, that he will really enjoy others experiencing pain and misery. Whereas modern audiences may empathise to a degree with Iago's belief in self-advancement, they are likely to recoil in horror at his racist language. Amongst a number of choice phrases, he hammers home to Brabantio his warped view of the outcome of Desdemona's and Othello's secret marriage. You'll have your daughter covered with a Barbary horse. You'll have your nephews nay to you. You'll have courses for cousins and genets for Germans. The imagery here suggests, disgracefully, that as a black man, Othello is somehow more animalistic than his Caucasian counterparts, somehow more akin to a North African horse than a human being. With his daughter's marriage to a black man, Iago is suggesting that Brabantio will inherit a whole breed of animalistic, unsavoury relatives, which he emphasised with the crude development of his imagery and his use of paranomasia, words with similar sounds but widely different meanings. From initially presenting the spectacle of Desdemona having sex with a horse lodged on top of her, Iago shifts to the wider consequences of other family members apparently and ridiculously making neighing sounds like horses, before stating that Brabantio will have racehorses, courses for cousins, and small Spanish horses, genets, for relatives for Germans. Just as, his, just as his ascendant earlier chokes Rodrigo and doesn't give him time to breathe, so here the anaphora, the repetition of the phrase yule in three consecutive clauses, relentlessly ushers in crude pictures of unwelcome inter interracial bestiality, whilst the paranomasia seen in nephew's nay, coarser's cousins, genet's Germans, blurs and confuses the boundaries between word meanings due to the similarity in sounds, thus creating links between previously unimaginable concepts, for example of nephews neighing, of racehorse courses being cousins to humans etc. Whilst Brabantio is not quite so quick to be incited as the dope-like Rodrigo, the effect is eventually the same. He ends up compelled to act, which will result in widespread disharmony and conflict, which Iago will relish. Another feature of Iago's character is his resilience and determination to continue striving to cause conflict in spite of temporary setbacks. Brabantio is largely unsuccessful in his challenging of Othello's marriage to his daughter, albeit to a large part because the latter is needed straight away against the general enemy Ottoman. Given Iago's off-stated antipathy towards Othello, the obvious assumption would be that he would be disappointed and mildly deflated by the lack of a sustained challenge to his black master's authority and smug newlywed happiness. If Iago is disappointed, he doesn't show it, and instead, in Act 1, Scene 3, resumes his manipulation of Rodrigo and his love-lust for Desdemona with even more ruthless vigour. 
His language shows continued racism and misogyny. He suggests, these Moors are changeable in their wills. The food that to him now is as luscious as locusts shall be to him shortly as acerb as the coloquintida. She must change for youth. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. The suggestion here is that a black man is inherently incapable of constancy, with an added implication that the pair are only together due to a sexual lust which will only be short-lived. Iago presents Desdemona as luscious fruits of the carob tree to Othello, which will turn bitter as an apple once initial urges have been satisfied. Similarly, Iago claims that Desdemona has become attracted by the power and size of Othello's black body. This too will fade, leaving her to realise the unsuitability of her choice. Iago's interpretation of this interrelational interracial relationship to Rodrigo is that it has come about purely through sexual desire and the sexual desire inevitably wanes so the relationship will inevitably fall apart. Of course it is difficult to ascertain the extent to which Iago himself actually holds these racist and misogynistic views or whether he is merely presenting them in order to convince Rodrigo that his pursuit of Desdemona is not in vain thus giving him a longer period in which to avail himself, like Sir Toby and Twelfth Knight, of his friend's money. What is already clear, however, is that he is prepared to adapt multiple personas when addressing different people. With Othello, for example, he is the subservient, loyal ancient, whereas with Rodrigo, he is the embittered rig leader, and use any tactics available to him in order to cause as much chaos as possible. Holding settled views and opinions seems less important to him than using particular views and opinions to his advantage. The end of Act 1, Scene 3 sees Iago revealing another apparent motivation for his bitter feelings towards Othello. Alone on stage now, he does not tell Rodrigo this time. He spits and lets shift to a 1965 production directed by Stuart Burge and which starred Frank Finlay as Iago. I hated them more. And it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office. Oh, I know not if be true. Yet I for mere suspicion in that kind will do as if for surety. So Iago senses that Othello has slept with his wife Amelia and has heard some rumours about this. Because of this, he will take revenge accordingly. However, what is significant is Iago's seeming disinterest into ascertaining whether these rumours are actually true. I know not if it be true, he says, and the reference to mere suspicion seems to suggest that he has put little effort into establishing whether his wife may indeed have romped with his black master. This in turn makes the audience wonder about his own relationship with his wife. How much does he really love her if he harbours feelings about her infidelity yet has not taken the trouble to get to the bottom of the matter either way? Although note that in Act 4, Scene 2, Amelia dismissively reminds Iago that he, that he suspected her with the more, thus suggesting he at least confronted her at some point with his misgivings. Alternatively, does Iago fall into a long line of Shakespearean men obsessed with the idea of being cuckolded? and perturbed by the difficulties in confirming innocence or guilt for what is essentially, unless you catch the pair actually at it, an evidenceless crime. But the fact Iago decides to act as if for surety, to act as if he knew for sure Othello and Amelia got it on, implies a disturbingly ruthless edge to his character almost as though the act of revenge is too enjoyable a pursuit to worry too much about whether the revenge is actually merited. Iago may not know the truth as to whether his wife has been unfaithful, but a simile within a later soliloquy at the end of Act 2, Scene 1, suggests that his doubts and suspicions are causing him far more inner torment than he has previously let on. From the comparatively matter-of-fact neutrality of Act 1, Scene 3, I know not if it be true, yet I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. Iago now seems far more embittered. Let's return to the 1965 production. 
For that I do suspect the lust for more hath leapt into my seat. The thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw my innards, and nothing can nor shall content my soul till I am even with him wife for wife. Or oh, failing so yet, that I put the more at least into a jealousy so strong that judgment cannot cure. The imagery suggests that his suspicions are figuratively nibbling away at his guts, infecting them like a poisonous drug, leaving him feeling permanently nauseous and ill, so much so that he wants Othello to experience the exact same feelings. One question I ponder when watching and reading Othello is this. Does Iago intend to reap the amount of destruction that ultimately occurs? Or does he become just an evil, egomaniac? Or has he always been one? Or do events spiral out of his initial control, leaving him as impotent as everyone else, in spite of his role as the preliminary catalyst? And I ask these questions now, as these words about Iago suffering the pangs of jealousy do contain logic. Because of his suffering, he wants to get revenge. And yet, later in the same speech, a throwaway use of parenthesis, which is the insertion of an additional clause or phrase into the normal sentence structure, for I fear Cassio with my nightcap too, makes Iago seem far less logical and more a man hell-bent on sketchily referencing any old person or possible events as utterly inadequate justification for his evil plotting. The overall impression at the end of Act 2, Scene 1, is that Iago may have been slightly harshly dealt with, certainly in his failure to secure promotion in spite of years of loyal service to Othello. But this doesn't explain his disproportionately violent and psychopathic vision. From calling on Helen Knight, to determining to practice upon Othello's peace and quiet, even to madness, the discrepancy between perceived wrongs and the scale of his revenge mission suggests that this is a man who is terrifyingly mentally imbalanced and extremely dangerous. I wonder whether Tim Blake Nelson, the director of a loose modern adaptation of Othello, O, felt that audiences might engage less with a film in which the villain didn't seem to be fully justified in the scale of his revenge. At any rate, his version, set in a boarding school in which the main male players are all in the basketball team, with Odin, i.e. Othello, by far the best player, gives Hugo, i.e. Iago, significantly more justification for his subsequent actions. Why? Well, his father, basketball coach Duke Goulding, very loosely the equivalent of the Duke in Shakespeare, but with a much bigger role, blatantly dotes on Odin, Othello, for his talent as a sportsman, and in doing so completely neglects his own son. In this scene, Hugo's father even goes as far as gushing to a crowd that he loves Odin like his own son. And I'll tell you something else too. And I'm very proud to say this publicly. I love him like my own son. The camera zooms in to catch Hugo Iago's expression. Whereas others are beaming and clapping wildly, Hugo just looks, and the viewer quickly gets the idea that he may not be wild about his father's public pro proclamations of love for another boy, particularly as later in the movie it becomes apparent that his father has virtually no time for him. The director even starts the movie with a voiceover in which Hugo Iago talks metaphorically about wanting to live like a hawk. All my life I always wanted to fly. I always wanted to live like a hawk. I know you're not supposed to be jealous of anything, but to take flight, to soar above everything and everyone. Now that's living. In this interpretation, Hugo Iago's voiceover suggests that he has always wanted to be above, separate and superior to other human beings, as well as being able to attack and kill at will. A hawk is a bird of prey. Certainly, the Iago in Shakespeare's play separates himself from all other characters, 
including his own wife, by always seeming to be playing some kind of role for his own advantage, which the others rarely perceive. However, the idea that Hugo in the film O always wanted to live like a hawk seems to suggest that he has always wanted to be malign, different and hunt. Whereas in Shakespeare's play, um, to some extent we sense that this has been triggered by his lack of promotion and suspicions about whether his wife has betrayed him sexually. The Iago in Shakespeare's play is such a social character, always seemingly getting on with people. Is Tim Blake Nelson's interpretation of Hugo as essentially a psychopathic loner pissed off about the lack of attention from his father, therefore shift unhelpfully away from the original? One key advantage Shakespeare's Iago has over his fellows is that he has an instinctive understanding of what makes each tick, an instinctive understanding of each person's positive attributes and flaws. For example, he may feel bitter towards Othello, but this doesn't blind him from acknowledging the fact that he is of a constant, loving, noble nature, howbeit that I endure him not. And so he frames his plot accordingly, electing to subtly sow seeds of doubt rather than openly jibe. Similarly, in Act 2, Scene 3, he uses his understanding of Cassio, his feebly low tolerance for alcohol, to provoke chaos on what should be a night of joyous celebration following Othello's marriage and the destruction of the Turkish fleet. Repeatedly railroading Cassio's objections, he argues, in, he argues ingeniously that not to drink would be disrespectful. Oh, they are our friends, but one come. I'll drink for you. And... What man? Tis a night of revels, the gallants desire it. Both quotations draw on the fact that they are guests in Cyprus, and as such they need to fit in with what is expected amongst the locals. In this case, drinking heartily and joining in the festivities, as emphasised by Iago's hearty, foe indignant exclamation, What man? Thus, under the guise of a blokey bloke, keen for everyone to have a good time getting drunk, Iago successfully manipulates Cassio into letting his guard down, resulting in the latter being full of quarrel and offence, exactly as Iago had anticipated, and being stripped of his rank as lieutenant. But Iago is not just able to bloke male Cassio into drinking but also to set the tone of their entire exchange in spite of his inferior rank. Act 2, Scene 3 opens with Cassio attempting to assert this superiority, welcome Iago, we must to the watch, and stressing the need for responsible behaviour. However, Iago directly contradicts his superior, and instead rapidly shifts the conversation to bawdy allusions to Desdemona's sexual attractiveness. What is notable here is that not only can Iago set the tone, but also clearly outmaneuver Cassio when it comes to the dexterity of his language. Comparing the two men's blokey comments about Desdemona's sexual attractiveness is revealing. Cassio's remarks are safer and more straightforward. He describes her as a most exquisite lady and an inviting eye and yet methinks right modest. Both comments refer to her beauty and suggests demure sexual allure. In contrast, Iago sniggers, he have not yet made once in the night with her, and she is sport for Jove, and suggests that her eye is a parley to, to uh, provocation. Whereas Cassio uses complimentary adjectives, Iago alludes repeatedly to the sexual act. The phrase sport for Jove suggests that Desdemona would make a great, fun sexual conquest not just for Othello, but for the king of the gods, Jove himself. Meanwhile, Desdemona's eye being a parley to provocation implies that she is such a saucy twinkle that she is positively summoning, demanding a man to make love to her the sooner the better. The fact that Cassio joins in to some extent with this exchange suggests that he is implicitly and unwittingly ceding authority to Iago, partly due to the latter's exuberance of language, but also partly because he is, ironically, not man enough to distance himself from laddish talk and activities. 
Indeed, I would argue that this failure to formally distance himself from Iago's sexualized world of illusion and double and, and double entendres plays a significant role in convincing Othello of his later guilt. However, it would be ridiculous to blame Cassio unduly for Othello's suspicions. Iago is clearly the man who expertly sows seeds which will plague Othello to breaking point. He starts working upon Othello in Act 3, Scene 3. The general is in a wonderful loving mood, totally unaware that his honest ancient is planning to destroy his ease. This section is characterised by Iago's use of rhetorical one-word questions and anadiplosis, whereby the last word from a previous phrase is repeated at the beginning of the next in order to encourage unhealthy over-analysis of essentially innocuous language. Following Othello's observation that Cassio went between himself and Desdemona frequently during their courtship, Iago responds, Indeed, which Othello then echoes, Indeed. I indeed. Discerns thou aught in that? Is he not honest? The conversation continues with Iago's anadiplosis. Honest, my lord. Othello then attempts to affirm Cassio's honesty, although the fact that he has had to do so will give him fuel for potential angst-ridden introspection later, before shortly asking, What dost thou think? To which Iago echoes, Think, my lord. When I think of anadiplosis, I think of an opportunity for rhetorical expansion, to build up momentum from one idea to the next. For example, in Act 5, Scene 1 of Richard II, the deposed king sees his queen and addresses Northumberland to warn him that Bolingbroke could turn against him, arguing, The love of wicked men converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. The anadiplosis charts the different cycles and emotions through different stages of life and time. Fear can lead to hate, and hate could, could potentially lead to death. The anadiplosis is very different in Act 3, Scene 3 of Othello. Instead of momentum and charting developments, Iago uses the repetition to close down progression of ideas and force thought on topics taken for granted, i.e. that Cassio is honest and that further unanticipated thinking may be required. For Othello, he declares that such echoing may indicate that there is some monster in his thoughts too hideous to be shown. So, an effect of the single word, full-stopped anadiplosis, is to give the entirely misleading impression that Iago has far more disturbing insider information than he would ideally like to reveal, whereas the truth is that he is merely manipulating his master's language in an unexpected, creative way. Another technique Iago uses to unsettle Othello is the use of chiasmus, the repetition of ideas in inverted order, such as, in my own example, we gobbled quickly, speedily we devoured, which gives him a hugely misleading air of wisdom about the world and its ways. In Act 3, Scene 3, with the idea of Desdemona's dishonesty now planted, he talks of the agony of a generic lover who suspects his loved one may be unfaithful, but oh, what damned minutes tells he oh, who dotes yet doubts, suspects, yet fondly loves. The chiasmus is seen in the ABBA structure of dotes, followed by the two synonyms of doubt, suspects, before returning, for a, returning to a synonym for dotes, loves. The effect of this device is to give an alarmingly neat symmetry to the concept of suspicious love, and the close association between loving and suspecting is accentuated further with the use of paranomasia in the similar sounding dotes followed by doubts. Iago is forcing word and meaning associations upon Othello, is tainting the purity of terms such as dotes and loves in a memorable way which the latter will not be able to forget. But as well as chiasmus to taint, Iago uses anti-metaboly to continue to distort the clarity of Othello's thinking. 
Antimetaboli is very similar to chiasmus in inversing an order, but this time the exact words are repeated. To return to my own example, I would then need to say, we gobbled quickly, quickly we gobbled. Seconds after merging don'ts, doubts, suspects and loves into a mind-bending soup, Iago declares somewhat pompously, Poor and content is rich and rich enough, but rich is fineless, is as poor as winter. To him that ever fears, he shall be poor. In other words, to be poor but have peace of mind and happiness effectively makes you rich. But to have boundless wealth but worries is as poor as winter, cold, barren and comfortless. Iago then links these ideas more explicitly to Othello's situation by exclaiming, Good God, the souls of all my tribe defend from jealousy. With this exclamation, it becomes clear that Iago's trite truism is aimed at prompting Othello into fretting. He may have the beautiful Desdemona and be deemed rich in possessing her, but if he is constantly worrying about whether she has been faithful to him, such wealth ends up worthless. The anti-metaboli. Poor, rich, rich is poor, gives a false air of wisdom to Iago's words. The symmetry and repetition chime so well that they can mislead the listener into thinking their meaning has similar merit. Of course, Iago does not just use rhetorical devices to help plant seeds into Othello's minds, but so-called evidence as well. In addition to successfully manipulating Othello into assigning the whereabouts of a handkerchief extraordinary significance, Iago makes up lies about Cassio's revealing sleep-talking actions. Let's have a look at Iago from the Franklin Melton's 1981 traditional, largely faithful to the original production. In sleep I heard him say, Sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves. Then, sir, did he grip and wring my hand, cry, Oh, sweet creature, then kiss me hard, as if he plucked up kisses by the roots that grew upon my lips. Iago then continues, Then laid his leg over my thigh and sighed and kissed and then cried, Cursed fates that gave thee to the moor. Whereas Amelia's taking of the handkerchief can be discovered, and is eventually, albeit far too late, to save Desdemona. The joy of this lie is that it cannot be disproved. We do not remember what we do when we sleep. Once again, it is Iago's willingness to be crude, to describe lewd details such as legs being laid over thighs, which shocks Othello into imagining that what he is listening to may be true. Whereas early in Act 2, Scene 3, Iago only alludes to sexual details. Hear his graphic, quasi-factual description of Cassio's supposed nighttime movements with him makes Othello wonder terribly whether the former is merely replicating what he does on a regular basis, but with his wife. Iago's syntax is worth scrutinising once again. I talked previously of his use of a syndeton, missing out ands, ors, etc. between clauses, to incite Rodrigo into rousing, poisoning, incensing. However, here he shifts, shifts to Polly Sinderton when describing Cassio's physical movements. Then laid his leg over my thigh, and sighed, and kissed, and then cried. Whereas A. Sinderton creates an intensive claustrophobic effect, the multiple repetition of ands allows Iago to drag out and extend his descriptions of dreamy physical intimacy. Indeed, with each ant, Othello would surely be wondering which crude detail would be coming next, especially after kissed. In other words, the poly Sinderton allows Iago to dredge the maximum effect from his language and whip Othello into a frenzy of dizzying fury. As the play progresses, Iago becomes far more reckless, sensing that his plotting and manipulation must either lead to the death of those he despises or doesn't care about, or his own ruin. At the beginning of Act 5, Scene 1, in yet another soliloquy to the audience, he refers to the fact that he has miraculously persuaded Rodrigo to kill Cassio. Let's return briefly to the 1981 production in which Iago is played by Ron Moody. Now, whether he killed Cassio or Cassio, him or each two kill the other, every way makes my gain. He carries on thus. 
Liv Rodrigo. He calls me to a restitution large of gold and jewels that I bobbed from him as gifts to Desdemona. It must not be. If Cassio do remain, he hath a daily beauty in his life that makes me ugly, and beside the more may unfold me to him. There stand I in much peril. Iago is clearly under enormous strain at this point, yet he remains able to clearly rationalise advantages and disadvantages of different scenarios. With Rodrigo dead, he doesn't have to worry about the lavish gifts he has siphoned off. With Cassio dead, there is no danger of Othello directly confronting him about his supposed liaisons with Desdemona. But also, interestingly, with Cassio and his daily beauty dead, he feels he no longer suffers with the uncomplimentary comparison which highlights his own ugliness. What does Iago mean by this? The fact that Cassio has a daily beauty in his life seems to imply that he feels Cassio has an inherent goodness about him which can be gleaned on a daily basis. A goodness which indirectly highlights Iago's own lack of shining moral integrity and makes him feel bitterly inadequate. These words point to another side to Iago's character. Insecurity, lack of self-worth. Those that unwittingly hammer home these feelings should ideally be obliterated. Iago is, of course, eventually found out, but not before the deaths of Desdemona, Emilia and Rodrigo, all entirely down to his plotting and actions. In Act 5, Scene 2, Othello quite naturally wants to ask Iago, now no longer labelled honest but demi-devil, why he have thus ensnared my soul and body. Iago's response and final words in the play is, Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth, I never will speak word. Thus, his motivations for causing Othello and others such torment can only be gleaned from earlier conversations and soliloquies in which Iago has chosen to share his thoughts with the audience. He doesn't choose to, for example, rebuke Othello for promoting a ruddy mathematician ahead of him or challenging him with past suspicions about sexual activity with his wife. And of course, such words would sound ridiculously petty and inconsequential when faced with the typically Shakespearean tragedy mass of blood and bodies on stage at this point. Although others on stage are shocked by the idea that Iago won't even speak to religiously repent, this tactic allows Iago to depart the stage with a curious self-contained sense of dignity. No grovelling, no qu quivering from him, now the end is nigh. And also gives directors and audiences greater leeway when pondering his character. Is he simply pure evil? Or an ordinary man embittered by circumstances and bad luck who, by a series of extraordinary coincidences and chance occurrences, as well as linguistic brilliance, ended up being the root cause for so much misery and tragedy? In the words of our immortal R. Graham from the original ITV series of Blind Date, This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, exploring the fascinating character of Iago in Othello. Many thanks for watching.